A world filled with reverent statues, convoluted family trees, and mischievous halflings, Episode 3 of The Rings of Power has more of Tolkien's lore at work than you may have recognized. Anyone who's watched Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings trilogy is familiar with the epic scene in The Return of the King where Pippin lights the beacons of Gondor. The little halfling scales a watchtower and tosses a flame onto a pile of brushwood without the guards seeing him. This sets off a string of similar firebound watchtowers which send a visual message to King Theoden in Rohan that Gondor calls for aid. The scene is also mirrored in the opening chapter of the Return of the King book, although in this case Pippin observes the lit beacons from afar rather than lighting them himself. In either case, the opportunity to light some beacons is too good to miss, and it should come as no surprise that The Rings of Power found its own way to sneak some lit beacons into its adaptation. In Episode 3, when Galadriel and Halbrand arrive in Numenor on Elendil's ship, they pass a watchtower out at sea. As they look up, lo and behold, a beacon is burning. In this case, it's likely a lighthouse beacon designed for ships, but the callback to Peter Jackson's films is difficult to miss. The elves aren't the only ones with special statues. While Linden is littered with gorgeous wooden carvings, Numenor has a lot of its own sculptures, mostly chiseled right into stone. In Episode 3, as Elendil's ship sails down the narrow waterway that leads into the heart of his home island, viewers can see giant statues of heads perched along the route. Full-blown forms are also shown, including a gigantic statue just as the ship arrives at the main port. This last statue was a central point of speculation for months after it first showed up in the show's original Super Bowl ad in early 2022. Guesses as to the statue's identity spanned the gamut. Numenor has a lot of kings and queens, after all. But there are a couple of details that make one regal figure the clear frontrunner. First, there's a giant statue of a bird next to the humanoid figure. Second, if you look closely, there appears to be a small item bound to the figure's forehead. This indicates that we're looking at a statue of Eärendil, one of Tolkien's most important Middle-earth heroes. His wife is Elwing, who is turned into a bird at one point. He's also the father of Elrond and his twin brother Elros, who is the first king of Numenor. And the relic on his forehead? Eärendil ends up sailing through the heavens on his ship with one of the shining jewels, the Silmarils, on his brow. When Isildur first shows up, it's early in Episode 3 when we see the young cadet preparing for the sea trials with his shipmates. When the exercise is completed, they sail to shore and stand facing the water while the drill sergeant blows on a horn and pays homage to the massive body of water before him. The sea is always right! The sea is always right! The Easter egg here is tucked into the drill sergeant's accessories, specifically his shell-shaped musical instrument. The choice of a shell isn't just a fun way to show off the Numenorean penchant for sea travel, it's a detail that connects right back to one of the most important beings in all of Middle-earth, Ulmo. Ulmo is one of the Valar, the angelic beings who function as guardians of Middle-earth. Ulmo is called the Lord of Waters, and his power extends throughout all of the oceans, seas, and tributaries of the world. And what does a being as epic as Ulmo, the Lord of Waters, use to get some attention? Why, giant seashells, of course. The Silmarillion says that at times Ulmo will come to Middle-earth and there make music upon his great horns, the Ulumuri, that are wrought of white shell, and those to whom that music comes hear it ever after in their hearts, and longing for the sea never leaves them again. When we arrive in Numenor in Episode 3, there are a lot of sights to take in all at once. One of these is a stunningly vibrant tree with white petals. The concept of a white tree isn't new to Tolkien fans, even casual viewers of the films. In Peter Jackson's The Return of the King, a white tree can be seen in the center of a court in Minas Tirith, except this time we're looking at a corpse, not a thriving, living organism. The two images aren't just similar either, they're actually related. That's right, the dead white tree of Gondor can trace its roots back to its ancestors seen in Numenor in the Rings of Power. The Numenorean iteration of the Arboreal Wonder is called Nimloth, and it's brought to Numenor by the elves as a gift from Valinor. Eventually, Isildur takes a fruit of Nimloth with him to Middle-earth, where he plants it in Minas Ethiel. When that fortress is captured and becomes the headquarters of the Nazgul, the tree is destroyed, but one of its fruits survives and is planted in Minas Tirith. In The Rings of Power, Numenor is led by Queen Regent Muriel when Galadriel and Halbrand first arrive. In Episode 3, Muriel talks to Elendil about the struggle that her people have with trusting elves. 
Though elves have been unwelcome on our shores since the reign of my grandfather's great-grandfather. This feels like an eloquently written throwaway line meant to emphasize how serious it is that Elendil brought an elf back to Numenor. But as with all things Tolkien, things go much deeper than that. The author traced the entire line of Numenorean kings in his writings, which means we can take a quick stroll back up the family tree to see who Muriel's grandfather's great-grandfather is. And it turns out that it's a not-so-nice fellow named Ara Dunacor. In the book Unfinished Tales, Tolkien explains that, in this reign, the elven tongues were no longer used nor permitted to be taught but were maintained in secret by the faithful, and the ships from Aresia came seldom and secretly to the west shores of Numenor thereafter. When Muriel specifically highlights that her great-great-great-grandfather started the antipathy toward the elves, it isn't a line that the writers created out of whole cloth. It's a deliberate reference to a grumpy Numenorean king who ruled long before the Rings of Power story ever starts. When Galadriel visits the western regions of Numenor with Elendil, the pair of travelers visit the Hall of Lore, a library and depository of information that Elros, the first king of Numenor himself, created. While the actual hall is made up for the show, Elros is very much a Tolkien original. He's the brother of Elrond and a character that comes from a very complicated family tree that includes elves, men, and even the angelic Maiar. While Elrond chooses the immortal life of an elf, though, Elros opts for the mortality of being a man. Along with choosing the mystery of the gift of death, Elros also becomes a mighty king who founds Numenor and lives for five centuries. By the time of the Rings of Power, Elros has been gone for a long while, even as his twin brother still serves as Gilgalad's herald back in Linden. This leads to an interesting line when Galadriel and Elendil look at a tapestry of the twin brothers in the Hall of Lore. Galadriel confirms that she knew Elros, but makes an interesting statement. But I was always closer with his brother. For savvy viewers, this is a quiet connection to Galadriel's already established friendship with Elrond, but it goes even deeper. In the source material, Elrond eventually marries Galadriel's daughter, and the two will go on to serve on the White Council and generally resist Sauron side by side over the millennia. To say she's closer to Elrond is an understatement. Early in Season 1, the Harfoot leader Sadek Burroughs tells an endlessly inquisitive Nori Brandyfoot that the stars are strange. The foreboding words materialize in the form of the Stranger, who crash lands from the sky right near the Harfoot community. Nori takes the Stranger under her tiny yet formidable wing, and in Episode 3, it comes out that she's been helping the odd, super-powered giant. In the fallout, Sadek faces off against Nori, reprimanding her in front of the entire clan. At one point, Nori's father Largo chimes in, pointing out that the whole situation is extraordinary before asking if he'd ever seen beings falling from the stars. Sadek has an interesting response. Pair of beings who had turned into stars, never the other way round. The reference to beings becoming stars feels random, but once again, it could be a quiet Easter egg pointing to Tolkien's famous sailor of the firmament, Eärendil. The hero ends his epic first stage career by having a shining Silmaril bound to his forehead before his ship sails off into the heavens over Middle Earth, in effect turning him into a star. The thought that a random Harfoot leader in an isolated community would somehow know about Eärendil seems unlikely, but the line could still be left behind for those to find it who can. Toward the end of Episode 3, we see Nori's mother, Marigold, confront her about her actions with the stranger, asking if she thinks it's destiny and that she's somehow special. The little Harfoot's response is telling. I know I'm not special. I know I'm just one little Harfoot in a grand, wide world. For fans of Tolkien's canon, the line echoes another spoken by Gandalf at the end of The Hobbit. On the last page of that book, Gandalf and some of the dwarves come back to visit their burglar friend in the Shire. Bilbo expresses surprise that so many things they hoped to happen had come true, at which point the Grey Wizard interjects, and why should not they prove true? Surely you don't disbelieve the prophecies because you had a hand in bringing them about yourself. Gandalf goes on to highlight the larger purpose behind Bilbo's story, saying, you don't really suppose, do you, that all your adventures and escapes were managed by mere luck, just for your sole benefit? You are a very fine person, Mr. Baggins, and I'm very fond of you, but you are only quite a little fellow in a wide world, after all. This concept of a higher purpose runs throughout Tolkien's stories, and it's cool to see the larger theme reflected in Nori's small yet significant story. When Galadriel visits Halbrand in prison, the center of the room is filled with a giant statue of a blue mermaid-looking female figure positioned as if she's swimming. 
It's an odd sight in a jail, but it may be there to help calm the occupants in their cells. Why? Because it looks an awful lot like the Maya Uinen, an angelic being known for bringing peace and calm to turbulent waters. Uinen is married to the violent Maya Ose, who has a reputation for causing storms at sea. The Silmarillion describes Uinen as the counterpoint to her spouse, adding, Ose's spouse is Uinen, the lady of the seas whose hair lies spread through all waters under sky. All creatures she loves that live in the salt streams and all weeds that grow there, to her mariners cry, for she can lay calm upon the waves, restraining the wildness of Ose. The flattering description ends with the line, The Numenorians lived long in her protection and held her in reverence equal to the Valar. While it could just be a random statue, the fact that she's loved by the men of Numenor and even details like the seaweed in her hair seem to reinforce the idea that we're looking at an easter egg visualization of the Lady of the Seas.